Um, just to let everybody know that this will be recorded and put up on YouTube. So if you don't wish um, for your face or name to be put in here, just go uh, to participants, uh, right click your name and you can change it there and turn your screen camera off as well, please. So tonight's event is called Now You See Me, Now You Don't. It's about seasonality in sea slug distribution. And we have the lovely Julie Schubert. I hope I'm saying your last name correctly. Um, proudly supported by Mask Events and by Reef Checker Australia. <clears throat> I wanna to begin tonight's talk just by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we sit on. Um, in my sense, it would be the Cubby Cubby people of the Sunshine Coast. Um, yeah, just wanna pay respect to elders past, present and future. So for those who don't know Reef Check, we are a nonprofit organization, mainly based in Southeast Queensland. Um, however, we are in 90 countries all over the world. Um, Australia, we are mainly based in Southeast Queensland. We're also up in Cairns and we head all the way down to Gold Coast as well. And we host local events in the community, such as this one, to try and engage and empower the community on citizen science projects that are happening in our local reefs. And we also go out and monitor the reefs um, with surveys, just like Julie and a bunch of other people on our team <clears throat> to go collect data to monitor the health of our local reefs as well. So just before we begin, um, there's a little bit of housekeeping Zoom etiquette to be going through. Um, if you could all please mute yourselves during the talk so we can hear it nice and clearly. And is, uh, if you could also turn your videos off just so we keep um, the connection of the whole event going strongly. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions as we go, please feel free to type them in the chat and we'll be asking them to Julie um, throughout the talk or uh, if there's only a few, we can compile them and wait till the end as well. And we also have a group photo um, during these sessions. Again, if you don't want your name or face to be in this, please just um, stay uh, muted, change your name and turn your video off. Otherwise, um, when we do, if everybody could please uh, have a smiling face and turn that camera on for a group photo to be posted on social media. Thank you. So um, we've got a couple upcoming events that I'll go through quickly just before we begin. This one is tomorrow evening, actually. Um, it's another Zoom event, so you don't have to go all the way down to Gold Coast. It's hosted by a good friend of mine and another Reef Check ambassador, Gina Broadbent. And it's a lecture um, on the reefs down in Gold Coast, which I didn't even know existed until two years ago when I joined Reef Check. And, um, they're as abundant and diverse as the ones in the Sunshine Coast, which are amazing, in case you didn't know. So that's 6.30 tomorrow night via Zoom. Um, in case anyone else didn't know as well, we do have a World Environment Month currently going on. So normally um, World Environment Day is one big fun event that's hosted in Cotton Tree Park, um, which we always attend. It's loads of fun, um, but due to COVID this year, they've decided to run it a little bit differently. And they've got something like 40 different events going on throughout the entire month. Um, if you head to worldenvironmentday.org, um, WED, um, it has a full program list on what's happening there. But there's lots of exciting stuff. So this is a busy week for environmentalists. Uh, in case you hadn't had enough of Zooms by Thursday, we also have a DIY bees wraps, wraps um, workshop going on. Um, it's a really, really cool event that's being hosted. Um, it is free and it's on Zoom as well, but it's just showing anyone and everyone who wants to know how to make your own beeswax wraps, which is um, an environmentally friendly substitute for glad wrap. They're a little sticky, but they smell amazing and they're conventional. 
And as always, we have our monthly beer yoga, um, which is an amazing event um, that I, wonderful me, am always at. So if you ever feel like looking at my pretty face, please come on down. Um, it's on the 21st of June this month. It's from, I think doors open at six. Um, well, the, the session starts, but they start at 5.30 for you to um, begin having your beer. It includes two beers and a whole yoga session with an amazing yogi of our choice. Um, and it's at your Mace brew house down in Kiwana for everybody that lives on the Sunshine Coast. It's a super fun event and I cannot recommend this one enough. Um, please head to our website to book that as tickets do run out. And um, due to COVID, we only have limited tickets as always. We do also have a Horizon Festival, which we are also attending. It's an arts festival that's being run again for an entire week instead of one whole day now. It includes lots of different activities. If you head to their website, there's plenty of more information on them, but there are heaps of different things like dancing, painting, live music, um, wonderful, wonderful things. And lucky last, next month, um, we have the introductory guide to coral taxonomy. Sorry, uh, we have a marine scientist and an educator from the Sunshine Coast, Gail Riches. She'll be giving a talk on everything coral reefs. And that's the 13th of July. So if anybody was interested in volunteering, um, please come and help us. We always are looking for volunteers. We've just had um, a workshop in the Sunshine Coast um, training a whole bunch of new community members to become Reef Check Ambassadors. Um, it only takes a few days. Um, you meet loads of wonderful people. Uh, you learn heaps of cool new things. And I can't say anything bad about the entire organization, Reef Check Australia. If you head to the website link down on the bottom right there, There'll be heaps of more information, but if anybody is interested, um, you can become trained to be a survey diver if you're a scuba diver or an ambassador to talk to people in the general community. And as always, please, if you haven't already, follow us on socials. We're very active on Facebook and Instagram mainly, but we do also have um, a bunch of other things. We do have a monthly newsletter that we send out um, with all of our events for the month and anything relevant um, given on that as well. And lucky last, I believe, oh no, not lucky last. One thank you to everybody, um, and I mean everybody who contributes to Reef Check in making this Coastal Coral series possible from Sunshine Coast Council, Brisbane Council, Gold Coast Townsville, the Clean Water Group, and Ask Events as well. Um, organizations such as Reef Check Australia cannot exist without the help of other local institutions and partners. So a big thank you to them. And a big thank you as well to all the volunteers. Um, this is a bit of an outdated photo, but to everybody behind the scenes that helps make this happen, including Erlen, Lindsay, Julie, everybody else behind the scenes, um, volunteer wise, big thank you. And on to tonight. So tonight's speaker is about Julie Schubert. She is an environmental scientist that's been uh, living on the coast for and working since 2006 on sea slugs from my memory. Um, she's a Reef Check Australia volunteer um, she is the Southeast Queensland project coordinator and a survey team leader uh, for Reef Check Australia, as well as volunteering with Turtle Care Sunshine Coast as well, which is another wonderful nonprofit organization on the coast. She creates one third of the Nudibranch Domain Sea Slug Survey Team as well, and is an absolute fanatic about sea, sea slugs, nudibranchs, which is what she's here to talk to us about tonight. She did her honours on sea slugs a couple of years ago, I believe in 2019. And without further ado, I would like to present Julie. Thanks, Pablo. No worries. 
I'll stop sharing now. All right, let's see if we can get this to work. Hi everyone, thanks for coming along. Um, get this happening. And, oh, there we go. Hopefully everyone can see that screen. Yep. With the pretty That's pictures perfect. on it. Great. Thank okay. you very much. Let's just reduce this a bit. Okay, so thanks for that intro, Pablo. Um, so just before I start, I'll um, fill you in. I'm calling the critters in this study sea slugs. A lot of people um, also call them nudibranchs, which for some of them is correct, but for others it's not technically correct. Um, nudibranchs are just one order of the heterobranchia, so there's a lot um, more orders in there. So we've got like head shield slugs, um, sap sucking slugs, sea hairs, side gill slugs, um, so most people just call them all nudibranchs because it's easier. Um, so, but I'll be calling them sea slugs, but we're talking about essentially the same thing. Um, so why did I do my honours on sea slugs? Well, for over 10 years, my dive buddies, uh, Terry Farr and David Mullins, um, we've been going out and photographing and recording all the sea slugs on the Sunshine Coast from pretty much from like Woody Point out to Flinders and up as far as Noosa. So that's what we sort of call our survey area. Um, and we sort of looked at it and so was, some of the species seem to have boom and bust cycles. So some of them will see yeah, hundreds of at one stage and then they'll disappear. And then we might see hundreds of another one. And we kept finding different species in different habitats and, and always coming across new ones. So. We said we've got all this wonderful data so um, maybe I should do something with it and um, I got my degree as a mature age student, very mature um, and so as Pablo said I did my honours back in 2019 which was only a couple of years after finishing my degree but I was fortunate that I had such a huge data set to work from. So with my um, supervisor Professor Stephen Smith from Southern Cross University we came up with a, with a plan um, because he's a bit of a nudie break nut as well. And he is actually one of the organizers of the, well, it's now international sea slug census that happens around um, not only Australia, but places like Vanuatu as well. Um, and we had our first one here on the Sunshine Coast this year. Um, fortunately, we didn't win the challenge of the month, but we were very close considering we had the least number of participants. But but anyway, we sort of said, well, is there a set seasonal pattern to, to the variation we're seeing in these sea slugs? Because, um, you know, it's, it's great to have anecdotal data, but, you know, is there actually a set pattern? And are there any tropical species moving south? Because we keep getting these new species turning up. So it's like, well, the only way really to find out is to do some data crunching and some statistics. So that's what we did. So well, why sea slugs? Well, we like them. They don't swim away. You tend to be able to get photos of them. Plus, a lot of people photograph sea slugs. And as I said, you know, we've got all these sea slug sensors going on everywhere, which is really great because it means we're getting lots of data in lots of different locations on sea slugs and where they're turning up. And often little things like sea slugs are left out of um, biodiversity studies because they consider that they add noise to data sets and if you're into statistics you know what noise in data sets is um, basically because they can be such small numbers or such huge numbers it tends to just make the patterns really wonky so they tend to leave them out but they said we're sort of thinking well maybe that's only because it's an unrecognized pattern in their um, their appearances or their seasonality because there's just not enough studies on that particular part of their ecology. They are also specialised feeders and, and therefore they could be an indicator of environmental change because some feed on hydroids, others feed on sponges, some feed on soft coral, some feed on other nudibranchs, some feed on algae. So if you're getting um, certain orders of slugs not in an environment, it's possibly an indicator that also they, their food source isn't there. 
So rather than swimming around and recording algae, swim around and look at the sea slugs because there's so many people out there studying them that um, the data's coming in and you can help address some of those gaps in the ecology of sea slugs. This is a little one. This is Pleuralidia julia. This is beautiful. It turns up on this almost black hydroid and they're the hardest things to photograph. So I'm really happy with that picture. All right. So being an honest project, we had to have, you know, clear questions that we wanted to establish. So one of them was, are there clear seasonal patterns to, this, to these sea slug assemblages? Most of the studies I could find were only done on short-term data. So around about 24 months or less, um, or they just concentrated on just one specific species. Um, so but with this one, we had the advantage of having a huge data set covering a huge range of species. We also said, well, do different habitats offer preferred locations? Because the yeah, anecdotally we were saying, well, we're finding different ones in the river to what we're finding offshore. So does this environment that looks apparently barren or fairly barren, it's a silty, sandy, what we call muck diving habitat, is it a niche for certain species or are the ones that are turning up there just vagrant? Do they just happen to turn up and you know, eat their food and then die off? Um, and do the assemblages, like for an inshore environment and an offshore environment, do they follow the same pattern or are they different? And because when I looked at the reports, there was a varied results in what people came up with when they started looking at this stuff with just their short-term data. And my supervisor, um, Steve Smith, and his, who was a PhD at the, at the time, who is now Dr. Matt Nims, they'd done some, taken these previous studies and applied some more specific statistical tests to them. And if you're into statistics, it's, you know, that's really exciting. But what they found was they came up with different answers to what the report authors had come up with simply by applying different statistical tests to it. So this large data set gave us the opportunity to test different statistical models over larger temporal scales. And then there are quite a few published papers now, mostly by Nims Smith or Smith and Nims, um, suggesting that species are moving south or polewood um, due to climate change. There's also reports of this in the Northern Hemisphere as well of species moving polewood. And what we don't know though is, are they actually moving because of climate change or are they just vagrants and they're just turning up at random? And, and the reason we say that, and I'll probably cover it a bit later as well, is that the majority of sea slugs have a um, planktonic larval stage. So they're, they're at the mercy of the currents and they can get transported in currents. They can get transported in ship ballast water, etc. But I'll go into that probably a bit later on. So we've got, we've got over a hundred dive sites that we sort of dive around locally. Well, we named them, you know, we found them, we'd go out in the boat, you find something on the sand and we go, this looks good and we'll drop in. So in order to make this manageable, um, we picked two sites, um, La Bolsa, because it's an estuarine site that we've dived quite a lot, and Nudie Ledge, because I had data from Nudie Ledge since 2011 and happens to be one of our favourite dive sites. There's approximately eight kilometres between the sites. So hopefully these videos will work. Uh, okay, so this is in the river. For those who haven't um, dived the Malula River, um, it's, a, it's a mucky habitat. So it's silty sand, there's a, um, turf algae on the rocks, there's little bits of hard coral. Um, when we first started diving it, we also found lots of octocorals, lots of different hydroids, lots of different algae. Um, we, get, we were getting uh, the Gorgonian sea fans in there. Um, it's not very good at the moment. It has a lot of silt in it, um, but it's, a, it's an interesting habitat for those who have dived it. Oh, sorry. And then this one, 
this is nudie leaf, so you can see it's, it's quite different. So it's about 16 metres deep at the bottom and about 14 metres up on top. The, um, the, the wall, sort of the front of the wall is sort of sparse coral cover and stuff. But once you get up on top, it's got a lot of soft corals, some hard coral, sponges, hydroids, bryzoans, algae, generally low silt levels. Um, tends to be pretty densely covered in coral. Um, the river only, depending on the tide, can get to six metres deep, but it's generally only around five metres deep at the bottom. Okay, so how did I do it? Well, we had all this data. So the data I used was only data that had been collected on dives on which Terry, David or I were on. There are other people that dive the river, but I didn't use their data because I couldn't confirm the accuracy of it. Um, so I, I basically just used an existing data set, which if you're doing an honours project, it's kind of taking the easy way out because you don't have to go and do all the field work. Um, but what we do when we dive, each diver photographs all sea slug specimens they cite unless there's hundreds of them and then we just stop taking photos and count them. Um, and then at the end of the dive, each diver prepares a list of the species they saw and the count of specimens. And then we collate that list. So David might prepare his list first and then he emails it to Terry and I, and then Terry will add his specimens onto it and then he'll pass it to me and I'll add mine onto it but we only ever take the highest individual count per species recorded. So what that means is if I saw three and Terry saw four and David saw five, we'd just call it five. We wouldn't add them together, which means potentially we're underestimating the number. But unless we know with certainty that the one I saw was different to the one David saw, we don't double count. But we also record the water temperature, the visibility, the length of the dive and the number of divers that were on that dive. While we didn't do a lot of analysis on that data, we still have it for further, uh, further studies. Now, then I had all this data. So I took out anything that was just um, identified from an empty shell. And there's two trains of thought on that. Some people say, empty shells should be included because a lot of mollusks have only ever been identified from the shell. And then there are other people who say, well, you should take them out because just because the shell's there doesn't mean that the species was there. So I just, I took them out. And then anything that was doubtful in its identification that was removed. And then we had one species um, or a genus, Unidentia, that I think we're now up to about 12 color variations of it. But because no one has done any uh, taxonomic research on these specimens in the river, and that's an unidentified species, we don't know if they're simply color variations of one species or if they are genetically different. So for this report purposes of this study, um, I just combined them and just called them one, one species. Now, because we also had some critters that we'd seen, some species, but only seen like one specimen, and then we have others that we've seen like 4,000 of them. Um, if you're into statistics, we did this. We did this thing called fourth root transformation. Um, and then there was a range of multivariate statistics used to analyze the data. Um, now, my supervisor, Steve Smith, actually did the statistics for me because I don't have the software. Um, and I won't bore you with the statistics because I don't really understand it either. So what we ended up with was from the Malula River, we had, so this is, this is the dates that we um, had data from. So for in the river, we had from 2014 to 2019. Um, and we dive day and night in the river because it's a protected environment. Nudie Ledge was from 2011 to 2019. As you can see, in the Malula River, we had 251 species from 41 families, um, over 168 dives. And at Nudie Ledge was 188 species from 35 families, um, over 41 dives. 
But interestingly, out of all of those species, there's only 62 common to both sites. And to give you an idea when I was talking about counting numbers and taking photos, in the river, we had over 13,000 individual specimens and at Nudie Ledge was four and a half thousand individual specimens. So that's why sometimes you give up taking photos and just count. So in order to sort of understand these assemblage patterns, I said, well, how rare are they? Because everyone keeps saying, oh, nudie breaks are rare in space and time. And I was like, well, just how rare are they? So when I, I did the analysis, as you can see in these little pie charts here, 38% of species in, at both sites have only been seen once in all that time. And there's 13% um, and 11% have only been seen twice. So around about 50% of species have only been seen once or twice at those two sites. Um, which shows you that you know, the majority of species are quite rare, which is why we had to do that data transformation to get um, more comprehensible statistical outputs. But it does confirm that, you know, like rare in, rare in space and times for sure. Then we said, well, are we gonna keep finding new species? And this is a species accumulation curve. And basically they haven't flattened off. So Nudie Ledge is starting to slow down, um, but the river just keeps on climbing. So un until everything is found at least twice, you, it, you're gonna keep getting um, more species turning up. And the other thing we don't know though, is whether some of these species that are turning up in the river um, have populations elsewhere on the coast. I do know there is one we've seen in the river recently um, because since I did this study, we've now found I recorded another 14 species at Nudie Ledge over 14 excursions. That's not necessarily new species to the list, but new species for that site. And in the river, we've added another 45 species over 50 dives. So the, those curves are, are still going up, but some of the critters, particularly there's one we found oh, a little while back in the river called Bonella anguilla that's quite common on the offshore reefs, but um, that was the first time we'd ever seen it in the river and haven't seen it again since. So we, we looked at rarity and then we said, well, how common are the common species? And of all of those, it was 251 species in the river, only four of them had been seen on more than 75% of surveys. And out at Nudie Ledge, only 10 species had been seen on more than 75% of surveys. So there's a lot of species that you don't necessarily see all the time at every dive site. And I'll show you some pictures because it's probably getting a bit boring listening to me talking. So this, this little guy, this is one of the most common ones from the river. This is Goniodorigella sp1. So Goniodorigella is the genus. sp1 is simply means it's an undescribed species and it's number one on our database. Now that's important when it comes to trying to compare or looking at range extensions, because we might call it SP1, somebody else might call it SP5. It might, you know, might be number five on their list. I know it is also SP1 on the Gold Coast, um, but that will make some sense a bit later on as to why I took some data out. These guys are quite little, quite often all you'll see is this little bit sticking out of the, the silt, um, but they can number in the hundreds. This is Terralidia semperi. This one is actually common to both sites. So it was one of the most common ones in the river and one of the most common ones out on the reef. Hypsodorus obscura. This was one of our common ones in the river. And Goniobranca staphne. So pretty much any time you go diving in the river, you'd see those guys. So this is the one, this is Bonella anguilla. This is one of the common ones from out at Nudie Ledge. But as I said, it recently turned up in the river for a little while. Um, gone again now. Dermatobranchus ornatus. And I'll tell you something about that guy a bit later on. 
Most people will have seen this one. Anyone who's dived or snorkeled on the Sunshine Coast will have seen this little black and white one. Be unusual if you haven't. Dora prismatica at Trimarginata, very common. Can appear in the hundreds. Hypsilodorus jacksoni. One of the lovely philidids, this is philidia oscillata, and it's, it's quite interesting because it has really extreme colour variations, all yellow and black, but very different patterns depending on where you are in the world. This one, we're calling this one philidia lalise. Um, there's still some debate as to whether that is. We really need some more taxonomists to study some of our critters here. It's a bit um, contentious, this one at the moment. Chromodorus cuderi. Everyone's probably seen this one as well, Philidiella postulosa. It's a very common, particularly on uh, reefs where you get a lot of hard corals, like out at the nearings, you'll get a lot of these guys. And I love these guys. These are Stagmanoptrum ornatum. And these guys can actually little flap their little wings and swim. So they're really cute. These are a, um, a Cyphopterum, so they're not, these aren't a true nudibranch, hence why we call them sea slugs. Okay, back to the boring stuff. Now, so what we did, we did this non-metric multi-dimensional scaling and basically each of those colours represents a season. And if you're going to get um, clear seasonal patterns, you, all your red ones will be grouped together, all your blue ones will be together, etc. Um, and as you can see, they're not, they're all over the place, which says there is no real simple clear pattern to the assemblage at Nudie Ledge. Then we looked at the river. And again, there's a little bit of, you know, sort of summer happening over here, but pretty much it's all messed up. This down here is in 2015. Now that was, we had a major flood come through from a, an, an ex-tropical cyclone. And um, I'll just digress here for a moment because I think it's a really important point and sort of reiterates why long-term monitoring of any environment is important. Prior to this flood, the river had gorgonian fans, soft corals, you know, lots of sponges, lots of variety in terms of um, like substrate organisms. After this flood, we dived it once the water cleared up. There was absolutely nothing. And I mean nothing. All that was there were urchin skeletons. It took six months before anything came back. Now we've had people say after some of these recent flood events, oh, the river's back to normal now, you know, after a month or so, oh, it's back to normal. But we're asking the question, well, what is actually normal? Is what we were seeing in 2014 normal or was that just one of those bumper years where conditions were ideal for huge diversity in organisms and is what they're now normal? So we don't know. So that's why, um, like with reef check, we say we we'll really need to monitor long term because, you know, you, you end up with new normals otherwise. And then we compared the assemblages and not surprisingly, given that there are only 62 species common to both, you can see um, new ledges over here, the rivers over here, so they've really got very little in common. So, but I'll Professor Smith went and applied some UBUT statistical analysis to all that data, um, which basically resulted in no clear seasonal pattern. Um, but he had proposed, or him and Matt had proposed this stochastic corkscrew model. And I'm not gonna try and explain it because it's really complicated. But basically what it means is that there is a pattern, but it's not a simple, curve that you would normally imagine it's a pattern that kind of goes around in a spiral and comes backwards and forwards and it means there, there is sort of a pattern there but it's a very complex pattern um and as I won't try and explain it because it's just way too hard um and the thing we found was nudie ledge actually also had a higher species richness because we find more species there per dive which we suspected anyway so then in order to answer the fourth question regarding range extensions, because remember all of those people were suggesting that species are moving south. I took just the species from these two sites, bearing in mind we've got I know, around about 900 species on our list. So I just took the species from this, these two sites 
and I compared those with um, all the, the websites I could find, like you know, Atlas of Living Australia, iNaturalist, um, ones I knew of, like Nudie Banks of the Gold Coast, the one that Dennis Reek has down at um, uh, Northern New South Wales, um, all of the reference books I could get my hands on, um, published papers um, in all different peer-reviewed journals. And I had to search not only on the currently accepted name, but all synonyms and previous names, because there's a lot of taxonomic work happening in the sea slug field, unfortunately not in Southeast Queensland. Um, and that's incorporating DNA sequencing. And a lot of the names are changing, either becoming new names, change back to old names. Um, so I really had to search under all of those names. So we ended up with, when I combined the two lists, I had 377 species. 221 of those were described and 156 are undescribed. So remember that little white one I showed you the photo of back a little while back, the Goniodoradella SP1. I took all of the undescribed species out because you don't know, you can't compare apples with apples if people are using different um, species numbers in their databases. So it becomes a little bit hard. And what I found was that um, from the data I could find, 39 species have their limit on the Sunshine Coast. That doesn't mean they haven't been seen further south. It just means I couldn't find any records anywhere. Somebody might have a photo of them in their, you know, their photo album, but it's not published anywhere and I couldn't find it. Um, we also have one endemic species. So he, it wasn't included in the range analysis because um, it's an endemic species. It um, has um, direct development it, from the eggs. It doesn't have a larval stage. So you will not find it anywhere else except the Sunshine Coast. And that's one called Glossodorus Vespa. And I should have had a photo of it, but I don't have one up on the board. Um, so that one was left out. This one again, which is this is one of our most common ones at Nudie Ledge. And it's sort of got its southern range extension here, but it's been recorded here since as early as 1982 by Richard Willen. So it's definitely got a population here. We've seen it, um, well, we recorded it 32 times out of 41 dives at Nudie Ledge, and we often see it at other sites. And most people that dive around the Sunshine Coast have probably come across it on occasions as well. Um, so of those 39 species, um, these are 24 that have been found somewhere else um, in Southeast, like in Queensland. And each of these little bar graphs, you probably can't read this, it's a bit small, but these are the different species and where the nearest record is. So um, you, you can see it sort of varies from right up the top of Queensland with the closest record being at Lady Elliot Island. Um, and then we had another 15 of those species. I could not find records of for the East Coast of Australia. Again, as I say, somebody may have seen them and photographed them, but they weren't on publicly accessible um, databases. And those 15 species, you notice this is sort of where, where the, the nearest records are. And you'll see they're pretty much up in the coral triangle, most of them. So up around Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. We've got one up here in Guam. This is um, Philidia guamensis, original. And we've, we do have a couple over here in the, the South Pacific. There is a current that runs, the South Equatorial Current runs um, east to west across, across here, hooks up with the East Australia Current and carries things south. So um, because the, yeah, they have a larval stage, there, there is the possibility of them moving with the currents. And we have yeah, different, the East Australia Current has different strengths and it eddies off in different places over time as well. So there's the possibility that, that things will move around. But whether they will establish populations, we don't know. Um, so basically we sort of went, well, 
regardless of the habitat, rarity um, is about 50% of what you, you find. And this is similar to even to places in the, like in the um, Coral Triangle, like Boonica National Park in Sulawesi. And that, again, they sort of had 50% that were very rare. We're sort of hoping that if we can understand the patterns of temporal variation, we may assist to identify long-term changes in habitat or range shift, because um, there are some papers out there suggesting that sea slugs could be used as indicators of environmental change, primarily because so many people are out there photographing them all the time. So there's lots of data available. Um, there's a number of factors that uh, will affect the species composition. One is that the larvae, um, as I said, some have a larvae phase that goes from minutes to days. Others have a longer um, period uh, in the larval stage. The, the strengthening or changing strength of the EAC um, can affect it. The water temperature, the food source, um, because the, I told him I want my own office. Um, Anyway, so um, yeah, so and food sources. So like a lot of them need a chemical cue um, in order to, to settle and, and metamorphose. So if they don't find that, um, you know, they can stay in the, the plant too long or they just don't, don't um, survive at all. Um, and also things like, you know, the coastal reefs not impacted by significant rainfall events to the same degree as the river. So environments like that get wiped out after a flood. Um, so that can affect the species composition. And we've certainly noticed lately that the, um, the diversity is certainly down and it's been down for a long time in the river, which is currently heavily silted. Um, and we, we know that there's 39 species that appear to have their polewood range boundary on the Sunshine Coast. Um, and others are seen sporadically. So, in order to say, well, they are establishing populations, so you know, tropical species are moving south, uh, we really need to analyse the data from all of those sites. And as I said, we've got close to 100 dive sites, so it's a lot of data, a lot of numbers to crunch, um, but that's a project down the road. Um, yeah, so, so they may be rare at these sites, but may be common elsewhere, same as the, the, the Bonella anguilla that turned up in the river. Um, it's quite common on the outer reefs. Um, so basically, we've already covered that. So that's fine. And obviously, there's been a heap of people on their dives, um, Terry and David. Um, and David's, we've got a website, nudibankdomain.org, um, which David is David's baby. And um, he's diligently going through adding all of our species onto the website and um, he's putting in information about the species. It's the website for aficionados of sea slugs because it contains more than just pretty pictures. He puts up nudie notes and lots of interesting information. Um, and um, he's also very good at taking photos. So when I find the really tiny ones, I call David over and say, please take a photo. Um, and then there's been quite a number of other people um, that have been on, on the dives. And of course, uh, big thanks to, to my supervisor, Professor Stephen Smith, for doing all that statistical analysis. Um, I really should learn statistics. I did it at uni, but it wasn't my forte. I'm sure all of you people who are uni students doing environmental science or marine science can probably appreciate that. Um, oh, just a really cool thing. This is useful and not learning steps. So I want to show you about this guy. I love this guy. Um, I keep calling them guys. Sorry. They're all hermaphrodites, so they're both male and female, but I just tend to call them guys, P. Hey. This one, um, generally found at night and um, cruising around on the substrate. Really cool looking critter. But we were out on the reef one day doing a dive and we're hanging on the five metre safety stop and this thing went swimming by. And as you do, I went to investigate and I caught it and it was one of these. So it was at five metres below the surface out of the reef and we're like well that's weird what are you doing up here so we took it up we put it in a bucket of water and then took it back down on the next dive and um, took some photos and last time we saw it, it was heading for the surface again so really don't know where it was going or what it was planning on doing because you normally find them 
plowing around on the substrate. So that was really cool. That was, I still remember that. It's my highlighted dive. Um, don't want to look that. And I did publish a paper. Um, this is a, a free access journal. Um, we looked at, simply looked at the rarity because everyone keeps saying sea slugs are rare in space and time. And we said, well, what does that mean? Because when you look at all of the different um, you know, papers and things that come up with this expression, none of them actually define what it means. So as part of this paper, I tested a couple of models to see, um, to see what, you know, what may be a more useful model or a useful model. Um, so if anyone's really bored and wants to have a read, they can have a read of that. It's free to download from the Diversity Journal. And that's it for slides. So if I can stop sharing. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I do have a question from Lorena, which was asked when you were asking, uh, showing us all those wonderful, colorful photos mm -hmm. of the sea slugs. Um, she was asking, is that camouflage they have? And do they all have that? And I think what she was kind of referring to was um, all the colors they had. Is that camouflage? And adding to that, how and why are they all so colorful? Why do they look like Pokemon? <laughs> um, okay, so some of them are very colourful, like some of those ones I showed you. That one, the, the Dermatobranchus ornatus, the one that I said that's been here since 1982, which looks quite colourful. When you see that on the substrate, it's very hard to see unless you have a torch because um, anyone who dives knows that the red goes out. The deeper you go, the more colours drop out. So, so ones like that, although it's quite pretty when you put a, a light on it, um, it can be quite difficult to find. Some of them look exactly like their host that they're sitting on. So you might have a green slug on green algae and they're really hard to see. <laughs> Others like that little segment optimal nadum, the little purple one, they're really bright. Um, and so there's a few that are really bright and some that are camouflaged. But with most marine creatures, these are the same. If something's bright and pretty, it means don't eat me. Um, I'm toxic. And nothing actually, sorry, hardly anything eats sea slugs. So there are some species of sea slugs that eat other sea slugs. There's a sea spider that eats some sea slugs. But there's not really much else. Some contain that big lumpy one Philidiella pustulosa, ugly looking one. If you put that in a fish tank, it will kill your fish. Um, it lets off something like hydrochloric acid. Um, some of the others have little spicules in their mantle. So if you bite them, it's like getting a mouthful of needles. Um, so pretty much they don't taste good apparently. I've never tried to eat one, but um, yeah, so the, the the colour is like for most marine creatures. If I'm pretty, don't bite me because I'll kill you. Awesome. And, and I was actually, yeah, actually just reading today something really interesting as well, that some of them have really bright egg roses as well. And apparently they're toxic too. So if you... Oh, wow. Mm, which is really cool. It is. Um, I have a question for you. Are yeah. you ever going to analyse the copious amounts of data you've been gathering? Are you going to do a PhD on it or something? Um, yes, I was actually planning on doing a master's by research to start off and then transferring that into a PhD. So um, they sort of got put on hold at the moment, but I'm hoping to pursue that, yes. And, awesome. Um, and look at some more of the ecology. Awesome. Okay, we've got one from Lindsay. Um, if there are many species that eat them, are the populations only controlled by available food sources and natural disasters, as you were talking about? Pretty much, yeah. So quite often, um, you know, once the food sources are depleted, that's it, they, they run out of food. Um, because basically they, they crawl. There's a few that will swim a bit and then they have to be at the vagaries of the, the tides and the currents um, to transport them to places. So if you eat all of your food, you're pretty well stuffed. We, we, there was a species that we were finding a lot of um, intertidal at Kings Beach and it ate the little Waratah anemones. 
Um, and then we went down sort of, you know, progressively and the anemones got less and less and so did the, the sea slugs. So we think they ate themselves out of house and home pretty much. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, before I forget as well, we do have some polling questions um, for those that remain. Um, they're simple questions, just where are you calling in from? Um, whether it be the Sunshine Coast, Brisbane, outside of Australia, and then we have one after this as well. Um, I have another question while we wait, Julie. I have yeah. a million questions. Um, what makes La Bolsa Park so diverse? What about the habitat makes it new heaven for sea slugs to enjoy um, themselves in plentiful numbers? Well, it used to be that there was a lot of hydroids in there um, and a lot of sponges. Um, it used to be very diverse in terms of food sources. Uh, at the moment, as I said, it's not. It's very, very sad at the moment. Um, sort of everybody dive report you read, that's, oh, it's pretty ordinary. And um, I know that Terry and David went and dived there again recently and they went, well, it's pretty ordinary. Um, so it, I don't really know why. I think part of the reason that we found so many species there is because it gets dived so much. So okay. if you look at the number of dives we've done in the river compared to the number of dives at Noonie Ledge, a lot more effort results in a lot greater outcomes. Okay. So, yeah, and yeah, so we, just, so we dive there day and night. So it's, it's basically a concentrated effort. Okay. So it's people like you going out and actually looking for them. That's well, right. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Lorraine has asked another question. Can they be seen along coastal areas like Coolum sometimes? Yes. So you can see them in the rock pools all up and down the coast. Um, you know, anywhere from, you know, Kings Beach all the way up to Noosa. Um, excuse me, you'll find them snorkeling. You can find them snorkeling, diving. Um, if you're looking for them in the rock pools, it's often a good idea to actually look under rocks. So carefully turn over the rock and look underneath because quite often they'll be hiding under the rock. Um, so, you know, it's quite fine to do that. Make sure you don't stick your fingers under the rock in case there's any blurring octopus or anything. But, you know, you can turn over the rock, have a look and put the rock back gently where you, you, know, you got it from. Um, but we definitely get them in the rock pools and quite often we'll get hundreds of the big sea hares in, in the rock pools up and down the coast. Okay, awesome. Um, there's another one from London. Um, are you more likely to see them during day or night dives or is it species dependent? Mm, species question. dependent. Yeah, so okay. you will often get different species at night to what you'll get in the daytime. So all the daytime critters go to sleep, go and hide under a rock, go to sleep and all the nighttime ones come out. So that's why nighttime diving is so cool because you see different different species, not only nudie breaks, but all the, the crabs and the shrimp and all of that kind of stuff comes out at night as well. So night dives are always awesome. Love night dives. Awesome. Um, so this is probably a dumb question, but there are nudie breaks that are active only that are nocturnal? Primarily, yeah. <laughs> so there are some that will, you will mostly see at night. If you see one during the day, of some species you'll go, well, that's weird. What's it doing out during the day? Um, so there are some species that it's very unusual to see during the day. Awesome. Well, if there are no more questions, um, we can have a quick photo shoot if everybody wants to turn their selfie cameras on, just for social medias. And then um, that's the end of the talk for the evening. So anybody that wants to say hello and be in a virtual 2021 selfie, um, please do. <laughs> Look at all these faces. It's nice to see who we're talking to after an hour of seeing black screens. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, everybody that's there, say reef check cheese. No, that's a bad one. Say <laughs> check <duty> cheese. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Awesome. Um, and thank you once again very much for presenting tonight, Julie. I haven't done that yet enough. Um, thank you everybody else for attending and we'll see you next month. Yes, thank you, Pablo. And I hope everyone enjoyed that. I hope the statistics wasn't too boring. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't. <laughs> we'll see you later, everybody.